the, the Twitter uh, announcement reminded me. Uh, I got an invitation recently to give a keynote at, I think it's the Higher Ed Web Dev Conference next year. Uh, it's a really nice conference for people working on university websites. And uh, they sent me the invitation, and in it, it said, you may have heard about what happened last year. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't anticipate uh, that that will happen again this year. And it was followed by an explanation of what happened last year, which was that apparently nobody there was happy about the keynote presenter or his presentation. And as a result, there were about 75 out of the 400 people who were in the room were, were uh, tweeting uh, about the presentation during the presentation sort of nonstop uh, and not in a positive light. And in fact, they sent me a link to an archive of all the, all the tweets from this you know, it's made interesting reading. And it also introduced me to two terms, which I don't know if they originated there and then. Somebody, maybe somebody can tell me. Um, one was um, harsh tagging, uh, and, and the other was tweckling, which is like a, a version of heckling. Uh, so uh, I, and now, and now anytime somebody says, oh, people may be tweeting while you're talking, it's kind of. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but you're welcome to say whatever you want. Um, uh, this uh, subject night, um, uh, oh look, a refrigerator. Um, no, <laughs> see, somebody got the reference, okay. <laughs> I was paying attention during the Kai bits. Um, I, I hold in my hand almost two copies of my new book. Uh, this one, I, this one, um, I printed out on my duplex printer at home and trimmed by hand and glued by, it's a hand-bound copy. Uh, on my book, and you, which you can see if you leaf through it, because some of the pages are not aligned quite right. And this one arrived in the mail today, so this is the first one I've actually seen. Um, they're not going to be in stores for another two weeks, hopefully, because um, the uh, files uh, uh, that need to be on the website and the website itself aren't built yet. Uh, <laughs> um, but I was going to pass these two around in case you want to leaf through it while you're. Um, so you're the first people to actually get their hands on them. People who work for Peach Pit, I guess, to get their hands on them. So, um, and uh, um, what, what else do I want to tell you? Well, anyway, we'll just dive in. So I'm sort of assuming that everybody here, um, A, knows what a usability test is, B, knows what a discount usability test is, and C, probably has could make a good guess as to what I mean by a do-it-yourself usability test, which is even lower rent than a discount usability test. And it's sort of what I've been preaching for years now, and there were chapters in the first book about it. Um, and this book is basically a how-to version of the chapters that were in the first book. So my intent here was real clear, was I think everybody who's working on anything should be doing their own usability testing in some form or another. And people don't seem to get that, and they think that it's got to be some, somehow complicated. And so the whole point of this was to say, there's nothing to this, and so you should be doing some of it, no matter what it is that you, that you do, more or less. Um, part of um, what I was going to do kind of quickly part of tonight was give you a little look at the process of how this book got put together. Don't, don't laugh. Don't laugh. Elizabeth Bale, who I won't make stand up, because. <laughs> She's, like me, she's basically a shy person who's worked with me for the last couple of years, had a big hand in getting this to happen. So she knows what I'm talking about here, and you, you will too shortly. Um, but like sausage and legislation, um, the process of, of me writing a book is not something you really want to see. Uh, um, so this is the, the cover, and that didn't really mean to go forward. But, uh, and here's the table of contents. I'll just leaf through it kind of quickly. Cause are, are you doing that or am I'm, I? I'm doing it too, and you're sort of following my body language? Like if I do this, you'll go, if, if I do that, you'll go forward? Is that, why don't we do it that way? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I have a feeling the back button probably works. Yeah, see, the back button works. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so uh, if, it jumps, if it jumps back suddenly, I did that. Yeah. All right. All right, so uh, yeah, so we, you, <laughs> there's <laughs> okay. So uh, it is, in fact, like in some ways, like every other 
uh, of the many good uh, books there out there about how to do a usability test. The chapters are, are, are pretty much the same. They cover the same ground. Um, they don't really have the same titles, I guess, uh, as most. In particular, uh, my wife likes I Will Now Saw My Lovely Assistant in Half, um, which, is, which is basically, it, it tells you to go watch the demo test. Okay, it's a live demonstration so on, on the video that will be on the web, hopefully before the book makes it to the bookstore. Ah, very good. <laughs> uh, um, and so, you know, it goes through the same thing. How, how, what, do you, what do you test and how do you, how do you find people to be test participants and how do you make up tasks for them? And um, mind reading made easy is the facilitating part, which we'll talk about a little bit and make it a spectator sport. Now, I'm going to talk about a bunch of these. Um, and then the second half of the book, you know, it's not really the second half. It's the second third, or the third third, um, is uh, about fixing problems. Because uh, part of what I realized in trying to figure out what to write and in teaching this as a workshop for years now is that there's not that much trick to finding usability problems. Usability problems kind of whack you over the head. If you just have somebody use the thing, but, you know, within 15 minutes, you're going to have more usability problems than you can fix. And that's part of the problem is you are going to have more usability problems than you can fix. So part of the trick is getting people to kind of contain their focus and focus on the most important ones. So I wanted to have a fair amount in this book about fixing the problems, not just finding them. Because I find that that's, you know, I will often see people do usability tests and they'll clearly uncover and agree on what the worst problems are. And then I'll go back six months later and look at their site, and those problems are still there. A lot of other problems got fixed, but the worst problems are still there for a variety of reasons. So, uh, OK, and then this was sort of stuff beyond the book, you know, if you, you uh, uh, stuff you can do once you've been doing your own do-yourself testing. Uh, so teleportation is remote testing. and. Uh, Oh, sorry, I need broader gestures. Um, people always say, when I tell people, you know, I'm writing, uh, was told them I was writing a new book, people would always say, I'm looking forward to reading it. And, and I would always say, uh, I am too. Uh, and not really facetiously, you know, it's like, because I, I knew from writing the first book that until I was finished with the second book, I would have no idea really what it was going to be, you know? I mean, I, I would have a lot of ideas. That's not true. I'd have a lot of ideas what it was going to be. But I would not really know what the whole gist of it was until it was done. Um, and I haven't read it yet. Uh, I, I, I haven't gotten enough distance from it to read it. So uh, it's going to come as a surprise to me. <laughs> that was a little fast. All right. Brief look at my writing process, in quotes. Uh, this actually the, the 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 preliminaries to this writing process are write the first book, wait five or six years to do a second edition of the first book, then wait another four or five years until it's like the childbirth until the memory of the first one is worn off, you know, and and and, and the publisher finally they finally relented and let the publisher talk me into doing another one. Um, and then, uh, so, so I, I always say that I, 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 hate, I do hate writing. I actually hate writing. And I think it's the hardest work that I know of. And I always say that I don't understand why anybody would do writing unless somebody was holding some sort of gun to their head, which is what contracts and deadlines are about. Um, so I finally signed a contract. Then you start collecting all these years of notes I have lying around. Um, I love making notes in the, in the margins of articles, and I'll actually do great diagrams, that, like diagrams I want to put in a book in the, in the margins of articles, and then I'll lose the copy of the article. So I try and collect all of those. Um, then with Elizabeth, Elizabeth's help, we put them in, sorted them into fo folders by chapter, what they were related to, and then built a wall, basically bought like 20 of those, you know, little cubby things that hold folders, and glued them to the to the wall in my office um, so we had some place to put all the folders that was visible then I drafted the chapters and then I went through the drafts and did what I do when I'm writing which is to rewrite the same paragraphs over and over and over I mean I will read a paragraph and I'll say no that's not quite right and I'll take a fresh stab at it and then I'll go back and read it and it's exactly the same as the first time through 
this is what, <laughs> what I do. So I end up with, doc with drafts that have like five, six, seven versions of the same thing, you know, after each other. So, so a lot of the process of getting it to, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, uh, then comes then comes <laughs> then comes the hours and hours of watching Law and Order reruns, okay? Because it's time to get down to work. Um, then and the, the same. This is kind of simultaneous with the Law and Order reruns. Is waiting for panic to set in, and then once panic has reached a sufficient threshold, you go back through the manuscript. I go back through the manuscript and start throwing things overboard, okay? Um, part of it consists of throwing out the six or seven versions, uh, identical versions of the same paragraph. Um, part of it consists of throwing out things that I know I'm just not going to be able to figure out how to do them right. I, they're cherished ideas. I really like the idea of having this part in the book or explaining this point, but I've been thinking about it for months and years and haven't come up with a good way to explain it, so I have to throw it overboard. The hard part is, in the throwing overboard process, that I, there are always things that I cling to desperately. There are always paragraphs, or usually they're series of like three paragraphs that work together and that work rhetorically and that make the point really well. But the problem is that they will never fit in with anything else. You know, like where they have to go in the book, there's no way to tie those three paragraphs in with what has to come before them and what has to come after them. But they're so nice, I can't stand getting rid of them. So um, then I'll usually. Uh, since that's not working, I'll outline the chapter again, like within the chapter, at the beginning or the end of the chapter, I'll create a new outline of the chapter so I can think it through. And then I'll do that again. So I sometimes I end up with three or four outlines in the, in the chapter. Um, uh, that looks familiar. Uh, yeah, then you really get into throwing things overboard. And then you, then you get outside help. So my friend Barbara Flanagan, who's a copy editor for Houghton Mifflin, um, who can, you know, like I'll just sit there and I'll read a paragraph aloud and by the time I've finished reading it aloud, I know what Barbara thinks I should throw out and I'll say, yeah, this sentence doesn't work very well and she'll just go like that and I'll throw it out. But it's not something I could do by myself. Um, and Elizabeth just did, all, you know, all kinds of things, uh, uh, too numerous to mention in terms of making stuff work. We keep throwing things overboard. Um, so the result of all this is that the book started out, it was supposed to be 212 pages, uh, the same as Don't Make Me Think, which I thought, you know, I was happy with how short Don't Make Me Think was. I was aiming for 200 pages, and I came at 212, which is okay, because they have to, you know, from publishing, they have to be done in signatures. So it was either 212 or 192, um, basically, or, or uh, you know, 212 with a whole bunch of blank pages, whatever. So. Uh, so, but I ended up throwing a bunch of things overboard, like this, for instance. Uh, this was going to be a comic book version of the demo test that will be available online. So this is sort of a transcript of this demo video that you watch to see how I suggest you do a usability test, but in comic book form. Um, and this was just these were just rough ideas for how to do it because the test wasn't done. And so this was kind of what it would look like, um, and it would end up being uh, 20, 20 pages long. Okay. But about a, about a month before the book was d actually finally done, um, it seemed like it was running long. And that, that was also going to be a bunch of work. So I just said, I'm honestly the only one who really likes that idea. You know, like all the reviewers like, looked at the idea and said, oh, this seems nice. Um, but I was really the only one who thought it was a great idea. So it threw that overboard. So there, there went 20 pages. One thing that actually helped me keep the book short in a good way was that every chapter has an FAQ at the end, which turns out I highly recommend it. It's a great, you can dump anything in the FAQ, and you don't have to figure out how to fit it rhetorically into the body of the chapter. No, this is, this is, like, this is like gold. This is comedy gold, Jerry. This is, like, this is great. So. so anyway, so what happened was the book was supposed to come in at 212. Um, it didn't even make 192. It actually ended up at 168. So as you can see, the people who have passing it around, it's a skinny little book, um, which I'm actually happy with, because I think it's what I wanted to have in there. Uh, the other good news is that because it was 168, they, they lowered the price from $40 to $35. $40 is way too much to begin with anyway. I, I, I didn't know that they raised, they raised the first book to $40, and they didn't tell me. And I like contacted them and said, the price is, the price is wrong on Amazon. 
and whoever I talked to said, oh, okay, we'll get it fixed, and it actually changed on Amazon for about a week, then it went back. It turned out they had actually raised the price um, without telling me. So public, uh, authors don't really have anything to do with that very much. So what, what's really, what I want to talk about tonight a little bit was uh, kind of what's different, I think, in the book, or what, what changed in my thinking um, in the book. And I realized that most of that's uh, captured in what we ended up, Elizabeth and I spent, what, we, we spent a whole day, maybe a day and a half, right, with the thesaurus and dictionary, trying to figure out what to call these things. Um, um, they were, for a, for a while, they were, um, oh, they were affirmations, right. And in fact, I even considered having a, a picture of, um, what's his name, my favorite, politi favorite politician, Stuart Smalley. Um, in the book, and that ended up not seeming right. So we ended up settling on maxims. And these are really kind of the things that, that I think are most important for anybody who's doing their own usability testing to know, to keep in mind, and to do. And they're also things that, in my experience, people seem to forget, or they lose track of, or they're not quite convinced of. So they're kind of things I wanted to really make a, make a strong case for. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, it's kind of like the thing where you're at an auction and you make some little gesture and you bid on something. I have to, I have to be really careful what I do. <laughs> um, so a morning a month, that's all we ask. This, this is basically I've been saying for a couple of years now uh, in, in the workshops in particular, um, is that I think, I think it's very important that uh, people um, set some, something like a morning a month. A morning a month, I think, is a, is a really good way to routinize this. And routine is making it a routine thing is really good. Um, uh, doing it once a month will actually produce, generate enough usability issues that will keep you busy for a month fixing them. Okay. Um, it also means one reason why I like to compress it to a morning. It can be an evening if you can't, you know, depending on how you what you have to do to get your participants in. But but half a day, uh, and I recommend doing three tests. So you know, either an hour or an hour and a half somewhere, with, depending on how long you leave between tests, um, and then having a debriefing meeting right after the test, so that everybody who's on, as we'll talk about in a minute, everybody who's involved with the product in any way is strongly encouraged to come to these tests. They're on, they're on site, they're at your place of business, um, and they've been scheduled a month ahead of time. Everybody knows when they are. I recommend making test day be a day when people are not particularly busy, you know, like a not busy time of the month and a not busy day of the week. Um, and uh, to encourage everybody to attend. And then by the time everybody, by the time lunch is over, you have done your usability work as a group for the month, okay? You've, you've gathered a, a lot of uh, great input about what's not working in, in what you've been building lately. Um, and you have met and decided what of that is most important for you to fix as a group. So it's a you make a commitment out of the debriefing meeting that you're going to fix these, these things before the next month of testing. OK. Um, start early than you think makes sense. I think anybody who's been involved in any kind of testing or, or user experience work knows that this is just true. You know, you, 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 it's never too early to start testing. Uh, people think it's too early to start testing. But it really isn't. And the sooner you get this kind of information, the sooner you, you actually watch people try and use what you're building or what you've sketched or what you think you're building, um, the better use you can make of that information. And obviously, the worst case is if you wait until the thing is fully built, and then you do one big round of usability testing, and you discover a large number of problems, which you can't then possibly fix. And what you do is you take that list and say, OK, Rev2, we will we will fix these problems. But by the time you get to Rev2, those problems are irrelevant because you've changed your platform and you've changed your business model and all that stuff. So, so it's kind of useless. So here's my little flow chart. Um, how people often think about testing is they, they, you know, if it's not done yet, if it's not complete, if it's not what people are going to end up using, then there's no point in testing it. Because we, you always have a better version in your head. Okay, You always know about problems that exist in what you've designed. And you always have some things that you know are problems, but you haven't yet had a chance to implement the fixes, even in the, whatever prototype you're testing. So that's one of the reasons why people say, oh, there's no point in testing early, because we already know about a lot of these problems. Why should we waste people's time having them point out problems that we already know about 
and besides, it can be kind of embarrassing. So, so why would we do that? On the other hand, this is really how you should think. <laughs> it's, it's, never too, it's never too early to start testing. Even if, if you don't have anything, if you don't have anything built, you test other, other people's sites. You test other people's sites. You know, other people's sites are the great neglected resource in, in, in terms of any kind of, of web design in particular. Um, I always like to say uh, other people have gone to the trouble of building a full-scale working prototype of a design approach to the problems you're going to be trying to solve. And so you can go ahead and do usability testing right now, <laughs> you know, and you'll learn what works and doesn't work about that design approach. And you wouldn't even have to think about building it into to, to your design. So, whatever. That's me. Recruit loosely and grade on a curve. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, this is, you know, this is, is, I'm tempted to say it's not all that true. It's not as true as I, it, was, it was to me years ago. Um, what it's a counteractive to is the idea that you have to recruit people who are specifically from your target audience and that that's the only kind of testing that's valuable. Okay. Uh, if you, if you, you know, when it comes time to test, if you ask everybody on the team, who we should be testing, they would all be variants of representative users or people who are like our users or people who actually use our site. And that's, that's what people think. And it's not an unreasonable assumption. I mean, uh, people, if, you, if, for instance, there are people who are never going to use your site, you don't particularly care whether they can use it or not, right? That's not an unreasonable, uh, unwarranted assumption. Um, the problem is that people get over finicky about this. And they think, we, they, think they understand who their users are. They think they understand what their users are like. They think they understand how their users interact with what they're building. And they also, in particular, think they understand what domain knowledge their, the people who actually use their site have. And they end up being wrong very often on all of these counts, you know? Um, particularly domain knowledge. I, I'm always uh, going out to clients. I'm always find that clients think that, that they understand what domain knowledge their, their, you know, people who use their stuff are going to have. And for one thing, they forget that everybody starts out as a beginner, and the beginners don't have all the domain knowledge that, that seasoned people have. And two, that seasoned people don't have all the domain knowledge that seasoned people have. Uh, my favorite example was years ago, I was working on a, a real estate, um, it was actually an application um, for realtors. Realtors is now trademarked, by the way. You can't say realtors anymore. Or you can't use the word realtors without a trademark. Um, that uh, I was going to reference realtors in the book, and my and Barbara said, "Well, we have to put a trademark symbol after it." Uh, seemed kind of silly. Um, this application for for realtors that allowed them to access the um, multiple listings. Okay, so at the time that was the only way you could get to the multiple listings was you had to be a realtor and you had to pay your annual subscription to get to the MLS and the MLS was basically controlled by this one company, and this was an application they were building for realtors to use. And I was um, you know, going through it, and I, since I didn't have domain knowledge, I asked the client, I said, there's this term here that's like used you know, kind of throughout, and, and I don't know that term. Do, do realtors know that term? And they all swore up and down that you could not possibly be a realtor in the United States and not use this term half a dozen times a day. Okay, it's just it's impossible. And so you, you know this was going. I mean, I, I basically, I was too close to the thing myself. I'd, been, I'd looked through several versions of this software, and so I didn't have any distance from it, because you very quickly lose your distance from it, which is why you have to watch, watch people, other people use the stuff. Um, and so I, I approached the realtor who sold us our house, who'd been in the business for 25 years, and was a really savvy guy and said, okay, can I pay you for half an hour of your time and just use this thing and think out loud? And he did. And obviously the first thing that he said when he opened up the application was, what's this? Right? So, so that, was, that, was where my, that was where my confidence in, in the notion of domain knowledge went, went way downhill. So, you know, t target audience is good. You certainly want to have people from your target audience to the extent that you understand it. But the main thing is you don't want to keep it, have... Uh, the desire to have people specifically from your target audience keep you from doing testing or make you do less testing. Sometimes your target audience is hard to find, um, and you don't really need them for, for, for all kinds of testing. Um, okay, the facilitating process, there's a lot in the book about, I, I'm always, I'm struck 
uh, all the time by how much the process of facilitating is like the therapy, therapy process, you know. Um, in particular, I mean, you're basically, you're trying to get this person to externalize their thought process so you can have access to it, right? That's what you're doing. That's what the think aloud thing is for. So you can follow along as this person is thinking, understand their decision-making process and their motivations and all that stuff. Um, so it turns out that the, the, the other thing that struck me for years is that the things that we say when we're facilitating usability tests are a lot like the things the therapists say. A lot of them are, you know, what are you thinking? Okay, um, I, my favorite is, you know, what did you expect would happen when you did that? You know, like that's a classic <laughs> therapy question. <laughs> so anyway, so there's this, there's this little chart of things that you can say. It turns out there aren't very many things that you can, there are very many things that you can say or that you have to say because like a therapist also, part of your requirement is that you keep yourself out of it. You do not want to tell this person what to do. You don't want to influence what they think. You don't want to lead the witness. You don't want to give them clues about what you think is the right way they should be leading their lives. You know, you really do have to keep yourself out of it. And as a result, your language is kind of constrained. The good news is you can do a whole session. All you have to do is say, what are you thinking? You know, I mean, and, and it also turns out that you can say, what are you thinking, like 50 times in the course of an hour, and people won't get ticked off. Uh, it's very odd, but people don't mind. I mean, so you tell them up front, I'm going to say, I mean, you know, I may remind you that I need to know what you're thinking. But I've never seen anybody get annoyed by somebody saying too often, what are you thinking? So, all right. Ah, mind reading, huh? All right, make it a spectator sport. This has to do with uh, um, observers and getting everybody to come and watch the test. Because there is this effect, there's this kind of seeing is believing effect to usability testing. How many people have, have sort of seen that where people come and watch usability tests and all of a sudden they just get it? They just understand that, you know, that, that they understand that their users, that the users are not all exactly like them. Uh, they understand that it's valuable to actually watch people try and use what, what you're, you know, I, I find that there's a very high kind of conversion factor, conversion effect. And so I think it's crucial that you get as many people as possible to come and watch the test live and in person. So you want to make that attract, as attractive as possible, which kind of boils down to having high quality snacks. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, boils, no, it boils down to a bunch of things. One is, one is having it on site so that it's really convenient. Two is keeping the session short and compact and announced well in advance so it's convenient for people to say, okay, I'm going to the usability testing this morning. Um, and uh, three is to just make the room, you know, kind of uh, a, a good environment, which means snacks. Um, all right. So here, yeah, so here's the here's the test room, and basically, I have a I, I ended up um, making real clear recommendations for all of this, all the stuff, all the apparatus of doing this, which is basically what I use, um, because what I use I think works really well. Uh, so I recommend that people use Camtasia and record the sessions, okay, because it doesn't cost, once you paid the $300 for Camtasia, recording the sessions doesn't cost you anything extra. I recommend that they get a USB desktop microphone, I recommend a nice one that can be had for 25 bucks, because quality sound is the most important thing. I don't recommend recording video of the user's face because I think it's useless and distracting. Um, I uh, recommend that they uh, connect the test room with the observation room by using a screen sharing service and the one that I recommend highly is GoToMeeting. GoToMeeting does cost $49 a month or your annual subscription is less, but it works really, really well. And when you move on to doing remote testing, it works really, really well. Um, so, you know, I, just, I, I make these recommendations and I'm sure people will argue with me and I don't have any stake in any of these companies. Um, but I thought it was kind of convenient for people to have clear recommendations so you don't have to then go and read an article about which screen sharing service is better, you know, because th there are pros and cons to, to all of them. Um, uh, and you certainly can get cheaper screen recorders than, than Camtasia, but I think it has a lot of good features. So basically you set it up. Um, now, now we're into fixing uh, problems. Uh, and this one is uh, how do you decide what to fix? So you've, you've watched three users try and do stuff, try and use your stuff, whatever your current stuff is. And now it's lunchtime and you're going to meet as a group and you're going to try and figure out what were the most serious problems, what were the problems 
that most deserve fixing in the next month, okay? And this is where I, you know, I do think that it's so important that you focus on the worst problems or most important problems, okay? Because again, it's so easy to come up with a huge laundry list of stuff that may be easier to fix than the most important problems, but then six months from now, those most important problems are still going to be there, and everybody who comes to your site is going to say, well, geez, I, I couldn't input my, you know, address. Why is that? You would think they would fix something like that. But it may be that that's a hard problem for them to fix. It may be that it's a database-related issue, and they can't change their database. From that. But there's always a way to do something about the worst problems. You may not be able to come up with a perfect fix for the worst problems. There's always a way to do something about them. So I recommend, so, you know, what I have in the book is just a form uh, that at the end of each session, everybody who's in the observation room is told that they should write down what they think were the three most important problems that they saw um, during that test session. Okay, while they're still fresh in their mind, they may, have all, they may have a whole notebook full of notes. They can keep as many notes as they want, and they can note bugs, and they can note future ideas and whatever. But at the end of the meeting, the outcome of the observation session is that they come away with a list of the th what the, to them struck them as the three most important problems. And that's what they're going to take into the debriefing session. Okay. Um, and when fixing problems, uh, I'm very pragmatic about this. I think the, and I'm very convinced of this now, having, having gone in and done this this way with clients a number of times and, and taught in workshops, that when you're trying to uh, figure out how you're going to fix problems, so I have a sort of method in the book for how you select the worst problems in the debriefing, and the, and the, but at the same time, you also kind of have to figure out how you're, roughly how you're going to fix them, because you're going to create a list of what, what everybody kind of agreed were the worst problems, starting with the worst and working your way down. Then you're going to work your way down that list until you run out of resources to fix them in the next month. Okay, So you have to come up with some idea along the way of how, how much effort is going to be involved in fixing these problems. Because I would argue that what you need to come out of the debriefing meeting with is a list of the worst problems that you are committed to fixing, not perfectly, but fixing in the next month. Okay, so you do have to figure out kind of what you're going to do. And the problem I see is that people try and do too much. Um, rather, than, rather than tweaking, they redesign. Okay, so where you could go in and do some minor fix that would eliminate this serious problem as a problem for a large percentage of the people who run into it, or make it a, an insignificant problem, even though a still large number of people run into it. Um, rather than do that, people don't, it's like the perfect is the enemy of the good or whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> look at this laughing. Uh, um, um, that rather than tweak something, people get suckered into redesigning. Okay, it's very tempting in the debriefing. It's very tempting to say, oh, we could fix that, and at the same time, we could fix this. And besides, we've got this redesign coming up in the next six months, and so we can make it part of that. That means it won't get done for six months, which means probably never. Okay, so you've got to focus on what's the smallest change that we think we could make in the next month that would eliminate the problem that we observed, not the larger problem that it's, a, that it's maybe a symptom of, but the problem that we observed. Okay. Get, get rid of that. All right, um, and uh, gee, I guess we're out of slides. So um, oh, I'll give you an email address anyway. Um, so um, now we're into the audience participation portion of our program. Um, there, I imagine there are some questions. Yes. Um, so ah, good. Um, I've always kind of agreed with the video of the person's face, but I was curious about why you said that. Oh, why I don't think you should bother with the video? Yeah. Well, the original, the original rationale for having video of the person's face was because you were going to make up a highlights reel that showed people okay. suffering, right? <laughs> so, you could, so, you could, so you could show that highlights reel to the person who signed the checks for user experience work so they would pay for more user experience work because it would convince them that the product really was making people miserable. Right? That was, that was the purpose. The problem is, I mean, back then, back then, um, that meant you had to do this in a lab where there were video cameras and a, and a mixer. Somebody had to go in and edit analog videotape. Uh, and so it didn't happen very often. I mean, it would happen sometimes. It didn't happen very often. Um, 
nowadays, it's actually much easier. You can use a webcam. Something like Camtasia will actually, you know, you just point the webcam at the person and you're done, essentially. You can include it in Camtasia. Uh, it does create much larger files. Okay, it creates kind of another level of, of where things can go wrong. Uh, and it creates kind of a storage problem. Um, but mostly, it's that I don't think you need it. Mostly, it's that I think what you need is really high quality audio. Okay, that's why I focus on having, using a USB microphone, okay, because USB microphone cuts out the sound card in your laptop or whatever you're using and gives you a much, much clearer signal. Uh, and something like GoToMeeting or Skype to get the audio to the conference room. Uh, rather than doing it over a speakerphone. You can have a speakerphone for backup, but you want the best quality audio that you can get from the test room to the observers. Um, and if you have good quality audio and you can see uh, you've made the cursor larger so you can follow along with what's going, you know, what's happening on the screen, then I think the video of the user's face is just a distraction. I really do at this point. So my only, uh, my only question then is, is there any other way to um, capture some of the emotional impact on users? I think um, the emotional impact is always in the voice. I think it's always there. If you listen to more than a, you know, more than a minute of, of what's going on, if somebody's miserable with it, it'll be clear. You know, I never had a, never seen anybody have trouble reading the user's state of mind. I mean, that's why, that's why remote testing works so well. You know, I, I do recommend it. It's, it's at the end of the book only because I think that you shouldn't do remote testing until you've done a bunch of in-person testing. Okay, you've got to get your chops. You've got, to, uh, you've got to get comfortable with the process so that you're not focusing on the process at all, you know, and you're relaxed. Because you will have to pay somewhat more attention when you're doing remote testing because all you have is the audio. It's not so much that you can't tell the user's state of mind. It's that it becomes like miscommunications get harder to handle. Okay, if things get out of sync, it's a little harder to handle. So you have to have a little bit of extra, you know, savvy to do that. But basically, I find that doing remote testing and just getting clear audio from the participant is every is almost every bit as good as doing it in person. I mean, it's like eighty. I forget what I say in the book. It's like eighty-five percent is good or something. Um, and plus, remote testing has enormous advantages in that it saves the person travel time. Um, you're recruiting, um, uh, recruiting. Pool. Thank you. I knew there was an English language word for it. Your your recruiting pool goes from people who are within, you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes of where you are to everybody, basically anybody who's got a broadband connection. You know, so so um, that's yeah. So I just I, I you know. That's great. Yeah yeah yeah. Somebody um, microphone. Yeah. Uh, I, excuse me. I, I like your approach, but one one problem and issue with wait, did you say but? <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. I missed that. I did. <laughs> By the way, I have to tell you. I have to tell you, Joe Dumas. A lot of people here know Joe Dumas. Joe Dumas. Joe Dumas. You know, a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, Joe Dumas graciously agreed to be one of my reviewers for the book, and he ended up doing this like heroic job. He did this great job of reviewing. And there was all this stuff that Joe didn't agree with. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> Joe agrees with a lot of kind of what you know what I have to say, but there's also I knew going in there was a lot that Joe's not quite convinced of, and he just did such a wonderful job of, you know, giving me all that and actually forcing me, you know, moving me in some direction. So yes, so but no, no buts. <laughs> no buts are okay. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> when you run just three participants, three. Uh, if you have any type of really Complex, uh, Is that that's off somehow? Oh. If, if you have any type of you know, it's on. it is on, maybe the battery is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just be loud then. Okay. If you have any type of really complex application or website, one issue is that you may not be even be able even to touch all the areas that you want to get feedback on with three people, and of course, three people is is much better than zero people. Right. But uh, what what do you what do you do about that? And do you do you run like different paths for every participant, or do you try to just focus uh, a priori on what you think really needs the most, or what's yeah. your approach? Yes, yeah. well, both of those. I mean, I, th I think you focus you focus a priori how you decide what you're going to test and what tasks you're going to test. Tasks are actually more important. It turns out there's even a study about this. 
that the number of tasks that you test and the kind of tasks you test are actually more significant in terms of uh, uh, encountering serious problems than the number of participants that you test. There was actually a nice, nice study about that. But so you're going to focus on, you've got, you've got a, so you're saying you've got a fairly big landscape. You know, you tell you got Yahoo Mail. You know, right? It's kind of the classic case. There's a lot of bells and whistles and moving parts and nooks and crannies, as opposed to a simple website where there's, you know, like page templates and a couple of interfaces and not that much. But if you've got this big thing, then you've either got to um, focus ju very judiciously on what tasks you're going to test, so that you're you're taking the ones that are most critical for you that people succeed at first, right? And and get get those worked out. And you also probably have to do more rounds of testing. I see. I would recommend doing more rounds of testing. Test twice a month, you know, with three people, as opposed to testing once a month with eight people, um, for a number of reasons. One is that I, I, again, I want everybody to come and observe, and I want everybody to then debrief as a group, right? Including stakeholders, including uh, management, and, you know, including writers, editors, somebody from tech support. You know, you want to get as many people involved in that process of watching and debriefing as possible, as opposed to. A small number of people do it, and then they write a report that supposedly communicates all this to, to everybody else. So, so I, I would put a much higher weight on keeping the number of pr participants down, and maybe doing doing more rounds. And you know, I mean, maybe you do it twice a month. I mean, certainly if you're in, in an agile environment, you got to do it, you know, every two fortnight or whatever, you know. So, um, but I think does that make sense? Is that yeah, yeah. What do we got? Oh, okay. What do you recommend if you're in a situation where you're the only person on a team coming from a usability point of view, yeah. and it's an uphill battle trying to get usability testing in the picture, and you know the rest of the team is saying, let's just start programming, let's just start building it out. OK. Yeah, not, it's not unusual. I mean, it's not at all unusual. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not at all unusual. But I, I, my, my only real answer for that is, to um, do some and get people to come and watch that. I think that's the only thing that convinces people that this stuff is valuable, I think, is, is watching some of it. So even if you do it, do it as a skunk works thing, um, it may be often the best thing to do actually is to, you know, say this, you know, next Thursday or week, two weeks from Thursday or whatever, we're actually going to be doing some the testing of our competitor's site. Okay, everybody can get behind that. Because there's no risk for them in it, then their their work is not going to be subject to any kind of criticism or whatever. And people are always kind of curious about you know what 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 everybody else is doing, especially you get marketing people and management interested that way. So it's kind of the only the only bootstrapping thing that I know of, which is to basically just do one um, and hope that that um, people get enthused about it. I, I, I don't know if that'll work in your. Your context. I mean, do it and keep doing it and keep it a, again a really low rent thing, so that the cost of, to people of attending or dropping by and watching some is really small. You know, it just means going down to the conference room. You know, you could do two people the first two two users the first time. So that's <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we can do one or two more questions. Okay, and I'm not going anywhere. So yeah. Oh. In the debriefing lunch, oh thanks. In the debriefing lunch, you said you come away with that with the fixes. So, are you including the use? Are you asking the users how to fix things? Because that's oh no. Of, okay. <laughs> be afraid. Be very afraid. No. Um, yeah, you won't come out. You won't come out of the first. Let me clarify. You won't come out of the debriefing lunch with a complete idea of how everything is going to get fixed. I mean, in some cases, it may just be Bob's going to do it. Bob's going to come up with a really bright idea, and we figure Bob Bob has agreed that he can probably do that in, you know, with two days of his time. Okay, and he only needs these two people to help him, and he needs this amount of their time. Um, so that may be as close as he can, can come to a spec. I mean, for some things the answer will be obvious. For some things it'll be, oh, we just change the name of the damn thing, right? That's the menu's got the wrong name, so we change the name. And even though that may be a very significant problem, it may only take you know three minutes to change because hopefully everybody. In the room can agree on that, but um, uh, remind me again. Sorry. Oh, asking the users, right? Of course, that scared me so much. Uh, <laughs> that's why I forgot. Um, users, users are users. Don't users are not designers. Users, uh, if you. 
Um, if you ask a user how, to, how, how they think something would work better, they will come up with an idea for you because you ask them, okay? But they're not designers, so hopefully you know a lot more than they do um, about design. It doesn't mean you don't listen to them. Um, it just means that that's not where your best ideas are, are going to come from. So I would never explicitly ask users how they think something, how they think some, something should work. And when users suggest an idea, um, like, you know, I think it would be much better, very often users will say, because they think you ask them there for their opinion. So very often if something's not working, they'll say, well, I'd like this much better if it had a map instead of a list of the states. I'd like it if it had a map. Um, my experience is that 98 times out of 100, if you then let them think through that idea, okay, and explain to you exactly how it would work, by the time they finish talking through it, the, the, the final line of the conversation is always, but I guess I wouldn't really use that. I'd probably do it the way I do it now. It's just, it's just the way it works out. So, so yeah, so I, uh, you, you, you're the experts. You're the publishers. You're the people who have the design savvy. You, you know what your objectives are. You know, the purpose of the testing is to expose you to how the users actually use this thing and how they think about it, to inform your design intelligence. You're the ones who have the design intelligence. And you're just looking to inform that. Oh, no, 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 no. That's just the stakeholders in the, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just saying during the test, though. Yeah. Can we do one more? I'm not, somebody else is choosing. You're, you're choosing. No, you're choosing. I haven't chosen anybody. <laughs> People were just handing somebody the microphone all the time. Uh, all right. Uh, whoever's closest to that. I don't know. Oh, um, and so, I've got uh, I've got two of the old book. I don't have any of the new book. I, I need to get the the, old, the new book back, by the way. Um, I have two of the old book to give away. Um, who's who's? I know everybody already has them. You can give give them away. Um, who, who's got, who's got like birthday closest to today? Do you think? What what? Can name name a birth date. December 11th. Yeah, closer. Anybody closer than the 11th? Sorry? Today. <laughs> okay. All right. And, and who was second? Who was second? What? Seven? We got a seven and a nine. Here, I'll rip it in half. Uh, uh, who needs one? Do we have any other sevens and nines? No? All right. You guys can decide between you. You can split. <laughs> oh, no, I insist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Last so question, I, I guess. I, I have one question. Steve. Yeah. It's a philosophical question, and I'm just curious okay. with your experience that you've had with usability testing. And I'm holding up a cell phone here. It's probably one of the worst th design things I've ever seen in my life. There's just hundreds of things on these buttons, and right? I just see everybody on the train every day frustrated out of their mind using these things. How can we uh, stop the people that are uh, from building this kind of crap? And it's just all <laughs> over. All over. Last night I tried to program a house, a home house heating thermostat thing. I almost punched it right through the wall. Oh, yeah. It's I love just, those. They're horrible. Horrible I love stuff. Those. Yeah. I, 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 I made sure this time that I got one that I could take off the wall so I could sit in front of the TV for an hour and program it. Right? It's like... Um, uh, can we take another question? I don't know. I don't. I, I, honestly, I, th I, I think I think they're gonna they're gonna keep building them that way as long as people keep buying them that way. That's the way it works, you know. I mean, it is the, it is the featureitis problem. If if something, you know, I'm subject to it. If something is in this, the problem is, you can't actually use the thing. There are things co complicated consumer devices like a, like a cell phone. You can't actually use it until you've bought it, right? You have to use it for a day or two before you realize how dreadful it is, okay? And and so and so basically, you are enticed by the shiny, you know, by the shiny things. It's got. I love, you know, you read about these features and 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 that's very enticing. So I don't know if there's a fix for that one. Other than my my related pet peeve on that is that Consumer Reports does a great job of rating everything except usability, ah. and so people are rewarded for the wrong things. Yeah, see, I actually rely on Amazon view reviews very heavily in my life. I rely, I rely on several things. I rely on Google. I now rely on Wikipedia, which I didn't for a long time. 
and I rely on Amazon reviews. And those are the things that work for me on the internet. Okay, and they have they actually have uh, significant productivity increases that nearly offset the losses that the other things cause. Yeah. So we all sit there and complain about these things that are hard to use, but you know, there's a 30 day trial period. Raise your hand honestly, how many people have actually returned a phone in 30 days? So we gotta do more of that and say it's not usable right. for action to happen. Right. Well, no, no, no you gotta pay attention. Days, but do your homework. I, th I think the problem is then once you've got it in your hands, you're kind of at a loss to figure out how you would figure out which one is better. You know, you just, you feel bad about it, but anyway. All right. <laughs> All right, well, um, I'm, I'm going to be sticking around and happy to talk to you. Yes, yeah, so and, Steve, and Steve will be around. Time. He can answer some more questions. Thank I'd you like all to coming out. Uh, lead around applause to thank our speaker, Steve Krug. And we well, have a little well, thank you. going away thank gift. You. Oh, it's the home game of Boston Kai. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Steve.